All right, I want, to th- I want you to think about the beauty of the world. Think about the thing that you find most beautiful. Maybe it's a raging waterfall. Maybe it's the simplicity of the robin looking for food in your yard. Maybe it's oceans crashing against, against the seashore. The natural world just brings us so much beauty. And I got to tell you, there's, there's someone who understood this. How many of you know the name Sir David Attenborough? You guys know the name? There's a few hands out there. Well, he loved our natural world, and he spent his life roaming the globe, sharing his discoveries and his enthusiasms with a patented semi-whisper way of narrating. So those of you who didn't put your hand up, you may not know his face, but I guarantee if you heard his voice, you've heard it. He had that, again, semi-whisper way of weaving the narrative about the natural world. And as a lover of nature and a friend of animals, David Attenborough thoroughly enjoys it all. Enjoyed it all. Except one animal. Rats. He despised rats. And on this, Sir David Attenborough and I agree. Our natural world is so full of beauty, but I guarantee not one of you thought of a rat when I invited you to think of that beauty, right? It's so full of beauty, vibrancy, goodness, but rats, I'm convinced that they're a direct result of Adam and Eve's original sin, a warped and twisted idea of something that was meant for good, rats, disgusting. Now, our family moved to our current house when Lindsay was pregnant with Parker. It was a house in a quiet neighborhood that we could grow into. You know, you you buy a little more house than what you need in the moment, and you plan on growing into it. Quiet backyard. I could imagine the kiddos playing in it as they continued to grow. Now, our yard is active with life. Birds swooping around, singing from the treetops, squirrels chasing each other along the fences. We've had skunks waddle by, raccoons playing with their young. We see foxes, we see coyotes, and we have plenty of neighborhood cats. Years have come and gone, and it continues to be a great house. It's a wonderful neighborhood. It's quiet, still full of life. It's friendly. Now, you may remember, there's an old GM plant on Ontario Street in St. Catharines. The plant permanently closed in 2010. And then it sat. And it sat. And it sat. Now, when large structures sit, nature begins to take over. And when you think of a large, abandoned building, what animals do you picture taking over? Rats. Rats. And they did. That whole site was purchased in 2015. The demolition of it began in 2016. Now, as it turns out, the company that purchased the property didn't bother to deal with the rats. And so as demolition began, rats were pushed out into the neighborhoods around that abandoned property. It was covered in the news in in St. Catharines, and I don't know, maybe all over Niagara. Rats. Now, I mentioned the wildlife we'd see around our home. Friends, after eight years of living there, I spotted a new addition amidst the squirrels and birds and foxes and coyotes. Rats. Rats. We'd spot them scurrying through our yard and under the fence at the back. And I wonder who hasn't taken care of whatever's back there that's feeding them. Now, friends, when I say I hate rats, I have a borderline phobia. And I come by this honestly. Mom, if you're watching, I blame you. (laughs) Sitting near my windows, my kids would laugh at me. And my wife, actually, too, if I'm being honest, she'd laugh at me because I'd be there. We'd be doing something, and it could be a squirrel that runs by. And I'd like, is that a rat? (laughs) I'm on edge ever since we spotted them. 
You laugh, Kimberly. You laugh. This is real. My attention is constantly split when I'm around a window between what I'm doing and is there a rat? It may be one of those little demons trying to take up residence in our yard. Rats began haunting my dreams at night. I'm not even kidding. They'd show up in my dreams. I couldn't be rid, rid of the devils in my sleeps. My sleeps, Kimberly. I'm just wondering how you watch the movie Enchanto. I lived with a worry of these creatures invading my life. Just lived with it. It was a summer of absolute disruption as the thought of rats was never far from me. And then they disappeared. Then they were gone. We didn't see them again. But friends, I got to tell you, while they disappeared from sight, they haven't disappeared from my anxiety. They just haven't. And in fact, this summer we saw a single solitary rat wander by. Haven't seen him since, but guess what happened that night? I had a dream where in our kitchen, we had some dishes in our sink and a rat waddled out from behind the coffee maker, fell into the sink and Parker was like, what's that? And in my dream, the rat jumped out and got him by the nose. <laughs> and he's just like, ah, anxiety. Phobia, fear, worry. There's lots of laughter here. You guys aren't in my head. It's not very nice, is it, Mark? Friends, worry is real, right? Anxiety can be real. And even if we jump on something that is a little bit humorous, Kaylin heard me kind of talking through this, and she said, Dad, you're going to tell that story? Why not? I think I'm loved in this place. Hopefully they love me. And they'll love me even though they know that inside I have a fear of rats. But the reality, friends, is, is you guys know the world is broken. Right? Whether it be the, you know, say those rats did invade our home. That would be, you know, a troubling thing. That wouldn't be fun. And we, we would have to deal with it. We'd get through it. There's far greater issues that we know we have to worry about in our world. Right? Our, our world is broken, and we know that this year probably more than ever before. There actually are things to worry about. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Right? We know that there's a war that's ongoing. We know that around the world, there's still people that die without enough food and without enough water. We know that there's still Millions of girls that are trafficked. Right? We know that there is so much to actually still worry about and be concerned about. What do we do with that? Sometimes I think that there is so much brokenness in our world that it actually threatens to bury us. We can drown in it all. Well, friends, you know that we've been working through Matthew. And we're trying to catch glimpses of Jesus. And well, what does Jesus have to say in the midst of all of this? Well, Jesus tells us some stuff. Matthew 6, verses 25 and following. And I hear him speaking to me. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, about what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear or about the rats that are scurrying in your yard? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. That's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and is tomorrow thrown in the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. 
and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I can picture Jesus talking to those who had gathered around him. And just like we can name the worries that are legitimate for us, they had legitimate worries. They lived under the constant pressure of an oppressive empire, right? They weren't rulers of their own destiny. They had to listen to the soldiers, right? There was extreme poverty that they had to navigate. There was so much unrest that they just had to navigate. But how does Jesus speak into it? Ah, see that bird over there? It's fluttering down. In the midst of all of this pressure and legitimate reason to worry, what's that bird doing? It's being natural for how it was designed. It's finding a worm for today singing a song of praise out of just existence. Look at those flowers over there. Look at how beautiful they are. You're worried for what you're going to wear. What about those flowers? Look at them just being themselves, allowing the beauty that God has packed within them to shine. In the midst of all the heavy stuff, Jesus points out the things that are around them, the things that are often missed. Now, I know that uh, most here have lived enough life that you come to recognize you value those little things. I've seen that by some of the gardens in your, you know, around your homes. You care about some of those little things, and that's valuable, right? You appreciate the beauty, the little things, the, the natural world as it emerges. Think about when the world got disruptive with, with the pandemic, Early on, as the world kind of went behind closed doors, there were reports of how animals were taking over again because they continued to live. Now, I understand. I think that we, were, we did well to follow all the public health guidelines. I'm not speaking against that, but I'm speaking about the anxiety that I know welled up in me. And again, I, I actually made a comment to someone I, I may be the only one in this room and on this stream, but uh, I, I watched The Walking Dead. It's a TV show about zombies, a zombie apocalypse. And I wondered, is this how it ends? Is this how it happens? A random virus, global pandemic. Is this the beginning of The Walking Dead? Are we ushering in? But irrational anxieties. And I didn't dwell on it, but it was a thought. I was like, I just wonder what's going to happen as a result of all this. Did I need to worry like that? No, I continued to have family, continued to have friends, continued to get up, go about my business, continued to live. Right? Just like the birds continued to live. I didn't need to be crippled by anxiety and fear in many ways, even in the midst of hardships, even in the midst of all the things we can name that are legitimate reasons to worry, we're invited to live into the people God's made us to be. Live into the natural uh, beauty of who we are. What are the things you like to do? Well, you continue to do those. Even when there's the possible nuclear apocalypse as a, as a result of, again, Nuclear armies being at war. It sits in the background of our current life, and yet we could continue to live, right? Kimberly, myself, and Jared are a part of a church league baseball team. We're going to play baseball even though there's a threat of a nuclear war that sits behind everything. You go about life, you live, even in the midst of it. You pursue the things you enjoy doing. It is worthy of gardening even under threat of that garden being destroyed, right? You garden. Because the worry of it, it's probably not going to happen. You don't get crippled by what possibly could happen. You live into who God's made you to be. 
In the midst of everything swirling around, Jesus says, do not worry, saying, what shall I wear? What shall I eat? What shall I drink? Right? All of these things that may possibly emerge for us. But what if? What if there's a housing crash and all the equity we've built in our home disappears? You live. You live. But what if? What if we, uh, gas gets too expensive that we can't go here or there or everywhere? Okay. You live. You figure it out. You walk. You carpool. You downsize to one car. Right? You, you live into it. You figure it out. But you don't, we don't need to get so worked up, tied up into knots over what may possibly happen. We live. What's interesting here is in this invitation to live, not in a state of worry, but to live into who we are, like the bird, just being the bird, or the flowers just growing and blooming. We grow and bloom and do our thing as God's wired us, but we do it under a certain understanding. The invitation is in this. Did you catch this? Verse 32, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So we live into who God made us to be, not because we're being ignorant of the future, not because we're simply ignoring what could be. No, we actually believe that there is a God who loves us. Right? A God who is watching over us. A God who is present with us. A God is, who is working out his purposes in the world around us. Now, I can't explain, and I'm not even going to try to explain how this plays out, but this is how Jesus is presenting it. You actually don't need to worry because your heavenly Father sees you, sees your needs, and he's got it. And I think part of that is we don't understand what God's up to in the same way that often Kalen and Parker don't understand what we as parents are up to, right? We just, there's more understanding, more complexity more going on, and they learn to trust. There's always food in the fridge. And if there's not, that's because I haven't done groceries, not because they don't have access to food. We will get food. They will eat. Right? We think of how, uh, on, on, again, Mother's Day, so many of us have come to understand how mom often, and dad sometimes, but mom seems to have a, a natural understanding of how to come alongside, uh, you know, kids in times of need. When, you know, Parker scrapes his knee, which happens a lot. He doesn't normally come to me. He goes to mom. Because, again, Mom Linz, at least, has an understanding of what he needs, the comfort. Uh, but I've also seen her say, okay, get up. You got this. Right? You don't need to, you know, wallow in that. You, it's time for you to get up. But she has a, a unique understanding to see through and say, do, do they need comfort right now? Do they need a little loving encouragement? A little challenge to rise up, to work through it. Right? And so here, Jesus is saying, whatever it is you're going through, you have a heavenly parent that sees you, that knows it, knows what you need. So we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry. We don't need to know how it's all figured out either. Because if it is a heavenly parent, we, like the kids, we just won't understand the complexity. We won't get it. It may not be what we want. We may not get McDonald's for dinner every night. We may not get chocolate milk before bed every night. We may not get to eat chips for breakfast. And we may not understand why, but it tastes so good. But parents do, right? So in the midst of, again, our anxieties and our worries and what's going on, Jesus is presenting a place where it isn't a closed world, where we just respond to the world like people who don't believe there's a God. He compares those who are following the Jesus way versus the pagans. And now, there's a, different, there's a few different results of sort of pagan mindset. 
right? The first is there's no God. The second maybe there's a God, but God doesn't care. God's only worried about his own thing. Doesn't care about me. Doesn't see me. Doesn't care about my worries and anxieties. The other is that maybe there's a God, but God can't act in the midst of this. Right? Jesus actually says the pagans run after these things. They worry. And with all the stuff that's swirling in the world, if there's no God, or if God doesn't care, and if God can't act, then friends, I think we should be worried. I think we should. But Jesus presents a different picture. Jesus says there's actually a heavenly father who cares, who sees you, who loves you. We get to respond to the world under a different framework. Instead of, again, a closed world where there's no God, and so it's just cause and effect, or a closed world where God doesn't care about us, or a closed world where God can't act, I think Jesus is actually presenting a bit more of an open world. We may, we may not understand why God chooses to act or not act in a particular circumstance, but we can trust that God has our best interest at heart. We can trust that God sees us. We can trust that God knows what we need. We can trust that God's got us. And then we can live. Then we get to live. So what's left? Instead of worrying, Jesus actually says, he says in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. When you're worrying about something, think of the mental space it occupies in your head. Again, I told you guys, I confessed to you that because of the rats, I couldn't be fully present with my kids. We'd be playing a board game and a squirrel would run by and be like, what's out there? Is that a rat? <laughs> right? I couldn't be fully present. And, and, it just, and then they'd end up laughing at me to my face. Where's the respect, right? I, I don't know. That's, but they'd laugh, and it would be fun. But I couldn't be fully present. Because your mind, in your anxieties and in your worries, we get caught up by the thing. And it wasn't even a rat. It was a squirrel. In our worries and in our anxieties, it throws us off of how to live life well. And Jesus says, pursue my kingdom, right? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. What you need will be added. Seek after what God's up to in the world. Jesus has just been unpacking, and we've walked through it. What does it mean for God's kingdom to break into this world? It's approaching life with new ethics, new values, right? It's about being, uh, you think of the Beatitudes, live, li allowing those Beatitudes to be embodied in our lives as we go about day by day. To be people who are unafraid to mourn. To be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. To be peacemakers. To recognize that living for God may result in persecution and still doing it. Kingdom of God breaking into this world. Pursue it. Live it. Embody it. Be a little bit of int intentional, even though all this other stuff's swirling. I mentioned it's still worthwhile to plant a garden, even in the midst of the threat of a nuclear war. Our worries can sometimes throw us off. It's still good to live for God's kingdom, even if we get hit by a car tomorrow. Right? It's still good to live and pursue God's kingdom, even if the end is near. We live into it today. We live into it today. His righteousness is about, again, living the right way to live. Righteousness, justice is the same word in the scriptures. So we pursue righteousness, we pursue justice, we pursue what's right in the world, and it's worthwhile to do so, even though, again, threats are all around us. We do what's right for today, in this moment, moment by moment, today, day by day, we just live into it. And all that other stuff, we don't worry about it. We're not going to fix it. We just do what's ours to do. Like the bird fluttering by or the flower blooming where it's planted. 
Right? We take our things seriously, but we keep it to our things. We don't worry about other people's things. What's ours today to seek God's, God's kingdom in our lives, where we are, and to pursue righteousness in our lives, in our relationships? We can't worry about everything else. And I think that's what Jesus gets at here. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Right? We can't worry about the future. We can't worry about someone else's life. We can't worry about the grand scope of history. We can worry about our little world, our little lives, our families, our relationships. We can seek God's kingdom in our church, in our lives. And again, friends, when we think about just those bigger things, when we take on the burdens that aren't ours to take on, we can't fix it anyways. We're just burdening ourselves. We're carrying a weight that's not ours to carry. In the same way that if we t- heap tomorrow's worries and anxieties on today, it's not going to fix anything tomorrow. It's not going to fix anything tomorrow. It's not going to empty tomorrow of its trouble. The tomorrow has its own troubles. We've got to face that when they come. But we can trust that God's going to bring us through. We can trust that our Heavenly Father sees us. Knows, what's, knows what we need, comes alongside. Again, it's often not what we want, not what we expect, not what we even ask for, but Jesus says that we can trust it. David Attenborough knew what was up with rats. He knew they were dirty, disgusting little demons. But you know what? My worry and anxiety about the rats missed the mark. Continues to miss the mark. This is not... Uh, even though it tied me up, it did so for no reason. They never used their sharp little teeth and little claws to burrow into our house. They never did that. Not yet. They may come, and when it comes, we'll have to deal with it, but why worry about it today? All right, today has enough worries of its own. There may come a day, but that's the day is not today. So today we live. Today we live, pursuing the kingdom of God and pursuing righteousness. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are at work in the world. We thank you that you invite us into it. I just pray that even though there's lots to worry about, lots to stress about it, we have the reminder that you as our parent, you see us and you care. You know what we need. May we trust that in your goodness, you will give us what we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.